Getting good at drawing or any other type of art really requires, in most cases, a large investment of time, a large investment of energy. It needs you to sit down and do it for quite a large period of your life. And one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how we motivate or push ourselves to do this. From my experience, it's much better to employ a positive approach here. I think it's a lot more useful to have a positive relationship to your art versus trying to use a lot of grit and determination or you know, really trying to push yourself to do something that you don't necessarily want to do. One of the best ways to do this is to focus on the ideas of habit the ideas of ritual as it relates to being an artist. What we want to do is create a positive relationship with sitting down and creating. We want to become addicted to art. While this is a relatively simple concept, I think there's a lot that we can unpack here, especially when it comes to implementing these ideas and thinking about how to apply them. We can think of the idea of a habit as being somewhat benign. It just is a thing that we do regularly, almost whether we like it or not. It's what we're drawn to do. It's what we have habitually done. The idea of a ritual is almost where we try and take control of this idea of habit and habitual action, and we try and engineer it. We try and create a system for building and reinforcing habits so that we are kind of living the life that we want. The idea of ritual is, I think, a great intersection between science and philosophy and productivity and also spirituality. So I'm keen to jump into this one. Let's get started. All right, welcome to the Visual Scholar podcast. My name is Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this show, we're all about demystifying the world of art, creativity and productivity so that you can get better faster and enjoy your artistic journey. So one of the biggest challenges that I think faces all artists, all of us together, is just this idea of drawing more or finding more time to create the art that we want. Now, not everyone spends their entire existence creating art. We all come at it from different angles. But I'd say what we're all trying to do is marshal as much of our energy in the most sort of efficient way possible so that we can you know, just do the things that we want and, and create the art that we want in the way that we want. A big part of what I'm about is trying to figure out how to leverage the more natural systems, both the natural focus systems, the natural learning ways that we can actually acquire knowledge and, and figure out sort of how to leverage those versus a lot of the other ways that people typically talk about, you know, achieving goals, let's say, which are often about, you know, it's more about cracking the whip. It's kind of about mind over matter to a certain degree where, you know, we're just going to organize our way out of it. And and I think a lot of productivity and a lot of sort of focus and grit and determination books and on those kind of things, I think that stuff's useful. There's nothing wrong with it. But, but I really feel like there's something special about the artistic experience where, we really need to be feeling positive or you need to be feeling a particular way about your craft because these feelings sort of pervade the work and they pervade our experience doing it. And often, you know, in many cases, the goal is actually to be doing it, right? To be doing it and to have some outcome. So, you know, it, it's less a matter of sort of gritting and, you know, grinning and bearing it, right? I think we genuinely have to work towards enjoying the process of art. And I think this is where these ideas of ritual or, um, you know, other ideas that are, again, leveraging the fact that we come from a history of natural visual skill acquisition. All of these ideas, I think, are much better ways to handle motivating ourselves and getting excited about doing art. And I think it's not just that, but they're going to be in most cases, a lot more effective and a lot more efficient because the skill that we're learning here and the practice that we're doing is still a very natural one. So again, that's where I'm coming at from this idea of trying to combine, you know, some of the scientific stuff that goes around the ideas of focus, um, motivation, etc. 
Um, but also trying to think about, again, how do we motivate the artist, right, who needs to feel inspired and passionate about what they're doing? Because, you know, again, that's the whole point. So in this episode, I want to unpack some of these ideas and firstly talk about what I mean by grit and determination as a motivation, motivational style versus the idea of ritual, you know, what, why they're different, where you can maybe utilize one to help you and, you know, another to help you in different situations. Secondly, I want to talk about, you know, how important habits are, right? I think that there's a lot can be said about this from a positive and a negative standpoint. And lastly, I want to talk about, again, the role of ritual, because while we can consider the idea of habit as being an important thing that happens, ritual is where we really try and harness that idea and use it for our own ends. And lastly, I just want to address this idea of when and how you might utilize these ideas and, you know, how this idea of building a ritual and developing this and spending time at this sort of stage of the process of trying to motivate yourself versus, again, just cracking the whip constantly, how that might relate to artists at different stages of their life. And lastly, we'll do a few takeaways, right? How can we sort of encapsulate this information and, you know, think about it going forward? It's worth mentioning that I'm going to do some follow-ups to this because a big part of the ritual is understanding how we can modify it. So in this episode, I'm really just going to talk about and make the case for why I think this is important for artists. And then maybe over the next uh, one or two episodes, I'm going to unpack some of the ways that we can really get in and hack this aspect of creating habits and motivation for ourselves. I think there's a lot of good things you can do in terms of uh, like sort of time, um, sort of natural rhythms, and also space, how you can control space and understand how our brain actually sort of engages in habitual thinking. So again, we'll deal with that a little bit later um, on in some following episodes. But in this one, I really just want to make the case for it so that, again, we can get excited about this and really understand how important, at least I think it is. So firstly, what do I mean by the idea of grit versus ritual? So, I mean, one of the things that I found really useful when it comes to leveraging the idea of ritual was when I was learning to be an artist. Um, this is actually ironic because this was after I got my first job as an artist. I got my first job in a video game studio and this was around 2000. One two thousand two, and there was a game that came out, so Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and all the level designers were playing this because they were all really into Quake. Because most people who designed levels for first-person shooter games were into Quake or Unreal or something like that, so they were all super keen for this game. They all played it, and we played it multiplayer. And I'd never really played a multiplayer game like that before, and it was really exciting. You know, you play at LAN um, after you know after work is finished or on a particular night, and it was super exciting. And it was a while later that I kind of realized, like, I could go play this game online myself without doing it at work. And I kind of started doing that, and I just sort of got you know really into playing first-person shooter games, um, and and I basically, you know, got sort of what, what you'd class as addicted to sort of gaming. And I played way too much of it. And I'd say that if I hadn't spent that three years really playing way too many first person shooter games, um, like Call of Duty, um, you know, Counter-Strike, etc., uh, and doing clans, you know, I'd sort of led clans. I, you know, spent countless hours thinking about strategies, talking about communication styles, right? I got really into it, right? I almost went pro. I think that the most pro thing I did is I, I won a, I won some sticks of RAM, right? In an official competition um, or as sort of payment for being in a, in a, in a clan, right? So I was like pretty close to, to being professional um, sort of level, like, you know, being in clans, spending all day doing this, not, not enough time drawing. Um, and this was a real problem because I was trying to obviously become an artist um, because that first job that I'd got sort of fell through, uh, which again often happens, but I was sort of freelancing after that. But I was just playing too many games. And what I noticed is that, again, this power of habit is something that can draw us from a positive and a negative thing. And I certainly learned a lot of good things about sort of interpersonal people skills through playing games. Uh, I met a bunch of people, none of which I really know now. Um, but you know, it's sort of interesting in its own way, but it really was just a sap on my career. It's just sort of 
a lot of energy towards something that really at that point in my life, I just didn't have time to do. Um, I really needed to get going and, and work on my portfolio and try and get more jobs and stuff like that. And yeah, it just wasn't really working out for me. And I just kind of notice again, that power of habit, because you would click on in Windows, you'd click on the start menu. And I'd be sort of, there's the habit, right, of like you click on the start menu and then you either click on your game and you play your game or I click on Photoshop and I work on my portfolio. And the draw of the habit, right, the habitual action of just like playing the game was so strong that, you know, I just kind of do that thing where everyone says like, oh, I'll just play, I'll just play for 10 minutes. I'll just play for an hour. And then, you know, 12 hours later, it would be five in the morning and I'm sitting there, you know, playing with the other um, three losers who are up at, you know, five in the morning playing Quake or something like that. And I'd just be like, damn it, where did the day go? And then, you know, you get up the next day and um, same thing would happen. I'd be like, no, no, I'm going to do it. But, but the habitual actions often are very subtle. So it was literally that point where I would click on the start menu and the draw, right, the habitual action of just playing the game was kind of, you know, so strong. And as soon as I did that, all of the other things just kind of take over, right? The addictive, like dopamine, um, the stress response, the excitement of sort of playing a game like that and competing against other people and, and having this whole sort of system of um, status around it. It's very, very strong. And the way that I kind of stopped was very simple. I bought a second computer and I put it on a second desk. So when it was time to upgrade my computer, I, I didn't upgrade the gaming machine. I bought a specific Photoshop based workstation. It didn't have a graphics card that would play the game because again, typically when you have a Photoshop machine, you don't need a 3D graphics card in it to this day. You know, you can buy the cheapest graphics card and it'll run Photoshop pretty well. So I just bought a separate machine and I didn't install the game on it. And that's how I did it. And I mean, to this day, I've not really played the game that much. Um, and, and that kind of was what did it. And it was like a strange thing where like I literally needed to physically break the habit of doing it to where it wasn't possible. And what I found was that, you know, it really was that simple is, is there was just a, I would sit down at, at the computer at the desk and I'd just be sort of forced along the idea of, you know, playing a game. Uh, if it wasn't on there and I had a separate machine and that was like my creative space, it's almost like it was a different space. And because it was a different space, I would do different things. And that just kind of tended to happen. And so, I mean, it's a long way to go to buy like an entire separate computer. Um, but one of the things you'll notice is I have more than one computer in this room. And that's actually a habit and a tactic that I've used to this day to great effect. None of them have any games on them, though. They're all for different creative purposes. And uh, again, that's something I'll sort of dig into a little bit more as we progress, maybe in the following episodes, talking about tactics. But it really struck me that it was that simple. And there was the me that wanted to become a professional artist and not be flipping burgers or doing something really mundane with my life, even though I didn't really have a plan B. But I just couldn't do it because the pull was so strong. And what I found is that that's exactly what I do now. It's just inverted. So there's no real inherent addictiveness to any particular action. I think we are just a product of what we do. A lot of those great quotes are very simple. You are what you repeatedly do. And what I do now is I have the same conversation, which is like, oh, I could play a game but I'll just go and open Photoshop and create some art because that's what I do. And there's not really any moral to it. There's not any good or right or wrong or like this is this thing or that's that thing. It's just like, that's just kind of what I do now. And when I do the other thing, it feels weird. There's obviously a lot of other association, you know, and, and sort of work that I've done to kind of make sure that, you know, I don't spend my entire life playing video games. It's just not really possible at the moment. But again, I feel like that's a good sort of example of how important like habit is and also the difference there between the idea of grit and determination. So I really tried using a lot of other 
sort of strategies to stop playing video games all day, every day. It's not like I was sitting there going, this is fine. Um, it was just sort of too much fun. And no amount of me feeling bad about playing video games and trying to, you know, think my way through it worked. It really was just a, a habitual physical response to the situation. Um, and again, I think that often when we look at what is recommended if you kind of need to kick a habit or if you need to build a habit is, again, a lot of it is a matter of these kind of grit slash determination models, right? Where you really kind of push yourself to do a particular thing. And I think that especially with art, the thing that we're doing is often like a positive thing and it, it, it should make us feel good. So if we're trying to build a habit of doing something, you're not trying to kick something that's really addictive or something like that. It, these are quite benign and natural systems of um, sort of habitual creation of, of sort of repeated action. I think it's really pretty easy to just try and engineer systems to create a positive reinforcement and a positive relationship to you creating and sitting down to create versus, again, trying to, you know, really kind of lean into the stick aspect of the equation, right? And I think that that's sort of what worked for me is just to kind of build that habitual, um, like positive relationship with creating. And again, you know, reinforce that with understanding that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to become a professional artist, etc. But that really struck me as how important and how effective the idea of just building a positive habit. And um, again, what I've done since then is really sort of dive into this and, and, and go a lot deeper to understand, you know, how these things function and how they relate to, um, you know, the way that a lot of things work in the world and, and why people are often doing the things that they do, why you or me do the, the you know, the same things day in, day out. A lot of it is habit. A lot of it is just, you know, us getting up in the morning and doing the thing that we did yesterday. And it's actually surprisingly easy to modify that. And, if you put a lot of effort into that initial idea, right, of if we modify the habit, everything else kind of takes care of itself. If we're constantly trying to crack the whip on ourselves or feel bad about it, it's very energy inefficient. The most energy efficient and positive and fun way that you can motivate yourself to do something, I think, is to just make it the thing that you do automatically without thinking it, almost whether you like it or not. It's just kind of what you do. And that's sort of been my experience is, you know, I think maybe I want to watch a movie. Um, but what I actually go and do is just kind of, you know, I wander into my room and, and then kind of sit down and then like, because um, I sit down in that desk, you know, then I open Photoshop and then I'm like, oh, what could I do? And again, it's like half an hour later, I'm just kind of doing it. So it's exactly the same experience that I have now. Um when it comes to sort of creating art and doing those things and the reinforcement that I have over years and years and years it is, is exactly the same where it feels fun and that's just kind of what I want to do. And when I weigh that, that up against other things, I'm just so used to sitting down and creating art and doing the things, you know, that I've kind of wanted to do um, that I kind of don't tend to watch as many movies or shows or, you know, play as many video games as I did back in the day again. And there's no real reason that I can give for why that happens. It's just kind of what I do. Now, the reason I contrast that to the grit model is that just that idea, I think, was very popular sort of five years ago, 10 years ago. And, and so I think a lot of people might have been sort of inundated with that sort of advice, which is like, in order to succeed in life, you need grit and determination. You need to be able to push through discomfort and we need to get rid of all these silly little children who are just sort of emotional little fairies. And, you know, you just need to do it. And that that's what success looks like. Um, and I think that might work for some, but, but again, from my experience, artists are, again, a little bit more emotional, we tend to be, we tend to be a little bit more sensitive and I think there's a lot better tactics and strategies that we can use, which is, again, why I'm making this episode. So I guess we can ask why this is the case, right? Why, why do humans work this way? I think a lot of it is similar to topics and ideas I've already discussed in the first few episodes of the, the Visual Scholar podcast is that 
you know, the subconscious mind is often what is kind of running the show. It's often these subconscious, very efficient things that we're doing that we're trying to build as artists. The idea of just sort of translating ideas and sort of feelings into an action. So we have a lot of these automated systems when it comes to being an artist and um, also just being a human. And a lot of this is important to understand if you're learning new skills, but also if you're trying to create new behavior, because it's the same idea. And again, this is why it's so important, I think, to appreciate what I would say we actually are, which is much closer to animals than these kind of highly rational thinking beings. There's a lot of the idea in the human subconscious, or not necessarily the human subconscious, but the collective conscious sort of zeitgeist, right? The, the, the larger mental model of the human is that we're doing a lot of things rationally. We're doing a lot of things because we want to, and we're having a lot of choice in the world. And I think if you observe the human, in most cases, people are doing things for no other reason than they did it yesterday. And if you actually kind of ask at a deep level, a lot of people don't have good answers for why they're doing the things that they're doing. People will get up in the morning, you know, day in, day out, go to a job. And, you know, you sort of ask, like, why are you doing this? Why are we all... No one really has a lot of good answers. Not a lot of this stuff is actually based on science. And again, you can see this from, for instance, the the recent sort of COVID-related work from home uh, sort of pandemic, right? Where everyone is kind of starting to understand you can work remotely. And everyone argues about this, like whether it's good or bad and whether it's good for productivity or not good for productivity. Now, I've been, you know, essentially working from home my entire career over 20 years at this point. And, you know, what I think about it is that, again, there's lots of really good aspects to it. It's very productive and, you know, it, it, it has its own challenges. But again, what you find is the reason that people, you know, get up in the morning and do the thing that they've been doing, it, it, there's no real reason to it. It's just that's what we've always been doing. And some people think this thing and some people think this other thing. Very little of it is actually based on any science of productivity, right? And what you sort of see is in, in most cases, you know, remote can be just as productive or if not more productive, and it can lead to people having much more fulfilled lives because they might get to spend more time with their family, whatever. Um, everyone's different. But the point is that the reason that people just went and did jobs and maybe, you know, didn't get good at working from home is just because that's what they'd always done. There's no real rational reason for it. There's no science. But again, everyone has these ideas. So a lot of what's happening is post-rationalization of some strange mental model of what is productivity or what isn't productivity or what someone prefers. You know, extroverts really like going to offices and talking to people. Introverts probably less so, for instance. Um, it's probably more important if you have introverts to maybe let them work from home. And sure, you know, if you have people who need to chat all day, then maybe they can go in and, and do something. I mean, there's not a good answer here, but the point is that very little of what you see, you know, if you're looking from your 50,000 foot, you know, alien observer watching the ants of humanity, um, you know, swarm over the earth, exchanging bits and pieces of uh, paper money for various things, is that most of the time people are just doing stuff for no reason at all other than that's sort of what everyone else is doing or that's what they did yesterday. And, you know, there's also not a lot of conscious thought. If you look into a lot of the ideas of sort of marketing and how people are actually convinced to do things which are really important, like give their money for a product, very little of it is irrational. A lot of it is to do with psychology and just getting people to feel good, feel a particular way. And in most cases, the reasoning is a post-rationalization. So people have a feeling that they should buy something, that they should like a particular thing, and then they overlay a post-rationalized reason for that onto it. So um, again, I don't want to go too far down the philosophical rabbit hole of sort of, you know, determinism versus, um, you know, sort of lack of determinism or whatever. But I, I think there's there's some real thought there that that's worth putting in to just realize that, again, in many ways, we are 
carrying around this sort of more animalistic set of behaviors, right, that are automated. And there's a good reason for why you want them to be automated. You don't want to always be consciously thinking about, again, what you're going to have for breakfast or where you're going to go or how you're going to get to work or how you're going to get to school or how all of these things function. You need to sublimate some of those things. A lot of them need to just happen for no other reason, because if you took on the burden of that, then it would just be too much. So it's very logical that we would function this way. And it's just important not to imagine that every single thing we do, especially a lot of these things that have heavy hormonal um, relationships, like heavy sort of dopamine, um, cortisol, stress reactions, etc. A lot of these things, again, uh, are done by the hormonal sort of system underneath, right? We're feeling particular ways about certain things. We don't necessarily have control of that association. And in most cases, these subconscious actions are running the show far more than the conscious action. Now, again, that might be something I'd love to hear what you think about that. Um, I know that that's not necessarily going to be everyone's sort of view of this, but that's my sort of analysis at the, at the top level is that habit is just a collection of things that we sort of have done in the past. We're drawn to them. There's often these kind of dopamine chain reactions in there, as I was saying, where Again, I'm wanting to play video games or engage in some sort of addictive behavior that's not necessarily in my best interest, even though it might be fun in moderation. And there's a chain of sort of hormonal interactions with a physical set of actions, let's say, i.e. when I click the start button, I'm probably getting a little sort of hit of something, you know, and as I, you know, scroll up and I go like, here's Photoshop, this is responsible, Tim, all right, I'm getting a certain hormonal impulse as my sort of cursor goes up to let's play the latest video game, right, I'm getting a different response. And I think that I'm being rational, but I think in most cases, the things that can really sort of upset us or, you know, put us in a really good position in terms of employing our energy and, and spending our our life force well, uh, we're often having to, again, factor in these unconscious habits very, very strongly into that. And I think what I would say is that the really good thing is that, again, in most cases, if you're not dealing with something that's highly, you know, highly addictive, um, and you're not, you know, overlaying that with it, again, like a strong history of that, and it's not intertwined with a lot of other sort of junk, uh, which can be very tricky to untangle, I'm sure. But in most cases, the the habit is sort of agnostic. It doesn't really care whether it's doing a good thing for you or a bad thing for you or whether that's good in this case. It doesn't care. It's just doing the thing that it used to do. It's just sort of, you know, building these train tracks that you can go on easily, let's say, right? It's sort of building these grooves within your pattern of sort of interacting with the natural world and it doesn't really care what the thing is. As long as you kind of feed it the right information, it'll help you along the way. That's sort of what I found overall. And, and I think that's the most important, the most liberating thing about this is that in many ways, if we can spend a lot of our energy influencing the habitual systems that occur, um, that again, what that means is once you kind of do that, it most of it is downhill. It takes care of itself. Um, and again, I'm often surprised by the way I don't play video games these days. Uh, I don't really have any desire to do it. And, uh, you know, often when I wait it up uh, again, you know, it, I just kind of end up being like, let's just get my sketchbook and I'll draw something. Um, because again, I've just trained my body to just feel like that's a more fun thing to do. Now, there's a whole system of like maybe why that is and um, you know, often I'm mixing that idea of like, oh, if I do a personal piece and then I can post it on the internet and then like a few people might like it and that I feel like, oh, that's really good. Um, you know, there's a lot of extra stuff there, but we often exist in these habitual systems that, uh, you know, it, it's often so easy to fix them if you know how. And the effect of that is so energy efficient that it's really, really important to get this, you know, area of your life sorted. I guess the real conundrum is often like, why do things that are predetermined for us, maybe sort of like, you know, easy to consume drugs or, um, you know, video games or these things like, you know, fun and interesting television shows or movies. Why do these things tend to be sort of easy to form as habits? And I think the difference here is that one is a really pre-designed 
easy to consume dopamine hit or whatever other sort of hormonal chemical is going on in your body to make you do the thing. These are situations where someone is kind of designing a nice system. They're designing something that's going to create the habit for us. And so for us, it's easy to build that habit because someone else is building the pathway. And I think that's why we often fall into these habits where, look, it's neither good nor bad. It's just that it maybe serves someone else's needs more than our needs. And depending on what you're trying to do with your life, you might you know, find that doing this one thing is, is really sort of stopping you doing what you actually want to do with your energy and your time on this planet. Going back to the example of me, you know, having a different workstation and again, you know, trying to create a separate parallel sort of dopamine addictive system is that that is a lot harder because I've got to do the work myself to think my way through it, to develop that set of incentives, to try and, again, build the habit of sitting down there, finding some way where that's going to motivate me to connect up again. What I want to do with my life to that little action of starting it, to appreciate and, you know, uh, support the successes I have along the way. That There's a huge number of things where, again, in order to build that habit, it's a lot harder because we have to do it ourselves. But Either way, the habit doesn't care. It just does what you know, whatever it's kind of designed to do. It, it's a very sort of benign computer program, let's say, and it's really up to you to just you know put the work in there and sort of figure out which one you want to do. But again, the reason we often get drawn towards sort of entertainment or escapism, I, I think, is is just because those pathways are set up for us and they're designed for us. Certainly, the ones that succeed are. All the unsuccessful games are ones that fail to get that dopamine reaction working well. All the movies that fail are ones where they don't make us think what's going to happen next, right? They don't engage all of those sort of natural things where we sit down on a couch and you you have a packet of chips or something and you want to watch a movie and it's entertaining and like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, all those things are very easy because someone else has done the work for us. And, um, yeah, but it's just as easy, easy to develop your own, um, and build your own sort of systems so that, uh, again, you know, you're doing the thing that maybe you actually want to do, um, with your spare time. The simplest way to view this is just that the habit is a kind of biological automation. It's just a little script that runs. We often don't know why it runs, but nevertheless, it runs and it has a particular output. Now, I think it's just as important, though, to look at the idea of how people in the past and, you know, what all the the literature says on how we can actually harness these ideas to our own service. And I think this is where, again, in the past, we see a lot of these ideas come up. A lot of the concepts of um, religious ritual or sort of daily ritual are really there to reinforce and ingrain particular habits in people. And this is how, again, we sort of bring ourselves together as societies um, and, uh, you know, sort of organize ourselves, organize our day. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that this stuff has been, you know, manipulated and people have controlled what they do and don't do and think about and how they start their day and end their day. And there's a lot of sort of best practices and things that are sort of recommended, you know, and that probably would have been the case way back in the day when you had, you know, early tribes bombing around the the countryside, uh, doing their thing, hunting and gathering. The way that you control this is by ritual, which is, again, what I would define the ritual as is, is, is like a conscious effort to control the idea of habit. It's important to note that, again, I'm talking about ritual very much separated from any ideas of sort of religion or spirituality specifically in terms of what it means from more of a scientific viewpoint, although I do think there are a lot of spiritual ideas here that can be really useful. And obviously, I think these ideas have been used by religions over the years to get people to do particular things. I think where the idea of ritual is so important for artists is that frequently people who are doing other things have these rituals that are very much part of what they do. When you go to work, you have a ritual, you have a thing that you do one stage after another. You have breakfast, you get in your car, you get on public transport, you go to your job. Same thing for school. There's a series of events and these things are part of like an onboarding, an on-ramp to you sort of entering a particular mode of thought. 
And I think these are really important because in most cases, these ideas go unnoticed. It just kind of is what you do. And the preparation for how a particular thing is going to have to be, how you're going to have to behave in a particular scenario at a particular place are often keyed in by these daily rituals of sort of transportation, of moving from one place to another. I think it's really important to hack these if you are working from home because you don't have a lot of these natural sort of influences of, of sort of time and space that kind of kick in these ritualistic habits and, and behaviors that are very normal. We're not really designed to kind of go from one place to another place instantly and have to change who we are, but we're very used to and capable of moving in time and space and therefore changing kind of who we are and what our expectation of how we need to behave is. If you're trying to play a sport, from the first few times you do it, there is a ritual involved in that. You go to a particular place where you're going to train or play. You might put on the clothes. There's other people there. And it's these feelings and ideas that sort of key you into the idea of, oh, now we're doing this thing. These are the expectations put on me. And again, you'll have a particular sort of feeling and emotion there where, again, if it's a good habit and a good experience for you, you know, as soon as you kind of get to that place, you start to smell the things, you start to see the things, it feels different. And again, you start to kind of just behave a particular way. As artists, it's often us sitting in a room and we don't have a lot of these other people or systems that are designed to kind of get us to feel and act a particular way. Um, so you kind of have to create a lot of this stuff yourself. The good thing about this is we have a lot of freedom here and we can really tailor it to our particular sensitive kind of extroverted, introverted needs, whatever they are. In the same way that working from home, I think, is really good because you get sort of an infinite degree of freedom in some cases. I think being an artist is really good because you can do art in many areas, in many times, in many situations. You can kind of choose your own adventure of where and how it happens to a certain degree. But I think that's a really, really important point to note is that often the reason that have habits get sort of created is because the system for, you know, doing them um, is created by the culture, by the society, by the group of people that you do it with. And that kind of happens naturally. And your kind of body adapts to that. And it kind of then is like, oh, yeah, I want to go do that thing because I remember this. When it comes to sitting down, we are much more at the mercy of our own relationship to it. So I think being more present, being more understanding of these things and developing and curating and creating and protecting your space and time as an artist is vital. It's so, so important to understand how these things will build positive reinforcements, positive relationships just to the idea of sitting down again. It doesn't have to be a fancy place to sit down. Um, it doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to be something where, again, you're keyed into what you need to do. So it can be a functional space. It can be a nice space. It can be whatever you want. But you have to be in control of the space and also the transition from how you get there um, and how you exit there. And that can be physical. It can be mental. And you may need to hack that and put a little bit of effort into actually engineering a feeling of transitioning from being a normal person to being an artist who's in their artistic space creating, let's say. I will go into these ideas in much more detail in the next few episodes where I really unpack again a bunch of stuff you can kind of do for this. But again, the idea of ritual, I think, is so important because, again, it goes unnoticed in most day-to-day sort of activities and I think there's a lot of people who you know might be playing football or something like that and that might be again if you're in Australia AFL you know if you're in Europe or South America it's uh it's sort of football right soccer uh in the USA that might be um sort of NFL right these people don't necessarily think of themselves as being ritualistic right of like doing these things but all these acts of going to a particular place putting on a particular set of clothes um, it takes care of all of this stuff. There's the social pressure, there's the status game. All of these things happen by themselves and they create these pathways of hormonal adaptation 
where again, you know, if you like that experience, if you like that challenge, if that thing, you know, sort of works for you, uh, then again, you just kind of uh, have this inbuilt association with it. And a lot of this stuff kind of takes care of itself. Again, not quite so much with artists. It's very easy for us to mess that up. And, and especially today when we're doing digital stuff where the, the idea of sort of sitting down at a computer it has many meanings to many people. Ideally, again, we would have our nice sort of studio where you kind of enter that room and naturally it's not really for anything else but creating and that ritual will naturally be created as a response. Um, but yeah, the idea of ritual and the idea of creating these rituals consciously is not something I'm saying. It's something people are doing all day, every day, even when they might not be aware of it, even when they're not really thinking about it. But they certainly talk about it and they try and engineer it. Um, certainly for all those people who are trying to run, um, you know, sort of sporting classes and those kind of things who are trying to get, you know, young children to be excited about, you know, sort of like tennis, football, volleyball, um, whatever, you know, they have to design and make sure people want to do it, right? They create the dopamine pathways. They make it fun. Why? So you want to do it more. And again, in that case, you have someone else doing it, which again is, you know, why it can be so important to have a school or a place you go to do your art. I think that's one of the major things where you will benefit from this natural transformation. But again, like I had to learn by myself, I think probably, you know, you might be someone who, again, is kind of at least having to do some of that lifting on your own. And I think, uh, you know, it's just important to appreciate this. This idea is not some woo-woo idea. This is just a fundamental building block of how humans have been motivating themselves to act, especially in groups, in social structures, since the first, you know, dawn of human civilization and, you know, sort of tribal culture. Now, exactly how you employ this into your life consciously is, I think, very much a matter of where you are in your artistic journey, in your life, in your career. And I think we often have different sort of requirements. I think often in the beginning, when we're starting out as artists, as I said, it's more a matter of like, uh, should I play video games my entire day or should I learn to do art for the rest of the day? That's often the conversation I'm having with, uh, you know, sort of students who are, you know, under 20 years old, who are still in their teens and are trying to sort of figure out like, okay, I've just stopped doing school. Um, you know, and uh, now I'm kind of like in this sort of university environment or a college uh, environment. And I'm kind of my own boss a little bit more. No one's really pushing me doing this way or that way, but certainly that's the way it sort of is in Australia. And, uh, you know, these people are really struggling with how to motivate themselves to do something that is actually meaningful to them. Um, when they've sort of been going through these school systems where, you know, everything's about, you know, being marked and tested every sort of uh, you know, every week, every day, let's say. And and again, often what people are struggling with in the beginning is like, I have so much time on my hands. It's almost like people have too much leisure time on their hands in some instances. And again, not for everyone, I'm just saying, this can be a real challenge for people, right? It's just figuring out like, how do I spend at least some time or most of my time, you know, doing the thing that I want to do as a career. Uh, but I think it's the same tactic you need to learn there that you're just going to utilize when, uh, you're a professional artist and you've been working for years and years and years and now you have a family and you have no free time but you just want to work on that personal project and try as you might you can't really find a way to kind of build it into your day you know you get home from work and you're like oh man I'm completely exhausted the last thing I can think of doing is like sitting down and doing more art figuring out again how to create the ritual, the habit to do that so that you do actually feel good about it. It is something you look forward to. It is something that works in your life, can be very challenging. Um, but again, in all of these situations, it's a matter of understanding what your needs are and how to sort of manipulate your, you know, set of scenarios, the time and space in your life to kind of make this happen. So I'd have lots of times where, again, I'd experiment with different things. One of the things that I found would really help me when what I was really trying to do was be more efficient. So I was trying to, you know, sort of really build more free time for myself. And I'd gotten to a point in my career where, again, I was getting professional work regularly. I wasn't sort of worried about like, oh, you know, will I be a professional artist? I was a professional artist. I had full-time work, more or less, freelancing. And it was mostly a matter of kind of how do I organize my day 
so that I'm not up late at night kind of finishing off my sort of work for that particular day, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like first world artistic problems, right? And yeah, I'd often find that, you know, it was, you know, things weren't working, you know, I'd sort of try and do this and then I'd sort of get distracted by that. And even, you know, if I'm not playing games, it would be other things, right? Looking at other art or getting excited about this, right? And what I found worked in that instance was that, again, I've often talked about the idea of manipulating the the area of intense focus to the area of your day where you know you have that focus. And so that was a big part of that. And what I essentially did is, is I would walk to a cafe that was near my house. It was about 15 minutes walk. Um, and in Australia, we have a big sort of cafe culture. So there's lots of these sort of cafes you can go to pretty much everywhere. Huge coffee culture in Australia. And um, so even though I live in suburbia, right, there's plenty of sort of cafes that I can walk to. And I would just sort of walk to this cafe. It was 15 minutes there. And I would sort of do this fairly early in, in the morning, right? Sort of before lunchtime or whatever, um, you know, after I sort of woke up, that would be the first thing I did. And I'd sort of walk there and I wouldn't have my computer. I wouldn't have anything. I'd just bring my sketchbook. And what I'd do is I'd work out the rough design work that I needed to do for that day. So in that instance, I was working on a video game. And, uh, you know, I sort of needed to design X number of characters per day. And what I did is I just made sure I kind of, you know, read the brief. I was there. There was no distraction. Um, you know, I, I was with my sort of girlfriend, who's now my wife. And, uh, you know, I was like, no, no, I'm just going myself, right? Just for sort of two hours. So I'd go for a walk. I'd sit down there, like read the brief. And I kind of like figure out what I was going to do for that day. And, you know, it was the process of walking to this other place. Because, again, I was working from home. And we were both at home. She kind of works from home, too. So, you know, it's very easy to get distracted and just sort of end up doing random stuff all day, right? Um, and then, you know, I'd always get my work done, but, you know, I'd often be working too late, let's say. So, you know, I just found I got into this rhythm and I kind of noticed this work. And at this stage, again, I was doing these things and I was noticing stuff would work, but I wasn't really considering it as like, oh, this is a ritual or this is, a, this is something where I'm actually actively controlling the habit. I just kind of noticed that I would get into patterns where things would work and then I'd keep doing them. Um, and then if anything would change, I'd get freaked out, right? So if for some reason this couldn't work, um, you know, it sort of, it, it got really cold. So it would be like raining and therefore like I can't walk. I'd be like, oh, nothing works anymore because I'm not doing my normal thing. But again, this is an example of where I found a ritualistic behavior that involves moving through space and time to get to a particular place. And that place would sort of remind me and key me into doing the thing that I needed to do, which was like, well, I don't have anything else to do here. There's no one else to talk to. All I can do is do this work. And I kind of know what I have to do. I kind of have to get all the characters that I'm designing today sort of sketched out. I have to have an idea for where I'm going to go. And as soon as I've got that, then I can kind of chill out. And then I'd sort of walk home. And normally that would take maybe sort of one to two hours is probably the average time. So I'd probably be away from the house for like two to three hours. And 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 that would be my time to just make sure that, right, I've sort of got everything for that day sorted. And then I'd come back and, you know, in that, in that case, I was scanning stuff. So I'd scan the pencils and I kind of organized them all. And at that point, I kind of knew like, right, at this point, everything's there. All I have to do is sort of render these up and, you know, sort of polish them up a little bit get all of that stuff sorted. And, you know, that meant I kind of had a good idea of how long that would take. And that really organized my day. I had a very solid understanding of like, oh, okay, if I do this and I go there, I'm so keyed into thinking about the design, doing the sketches, working that out, that that just kind of tended to happen. And then I'd walk back and I'd think about these other stuff, this other stuff, and then I'd get back and then I'd kind of set all these things up and then I'd spend a few hours rendering and then you know, then I kind of had control of my day. I, I really knew what I was and was not going to be able to do. So again, that's just an example of, you know, trying to sort of work these things in. And again, I think this can be a, a similar idea where, you know, you might have to move through space and time to really get your, um, you know, that, that habit and that ritual working because it's one of the most effective ways to do that. But 
What I noticed is, again, there's a lot of other ways you can do this if you don't quite have the luxury of being able to walk to a coffee shop for, you know, and spend three hours in the middle of the day um, because you're a professional artist. Because, again, there's lots of things that happen to us where maybe you're wanting to do it as a hobby. Um, maybe, again, you're just wanting to carve out a little bit of extra time. There's lots and lots of different ways that this can sort of affect us. But that's just one good example of how I really found that Utilizing these ideas of space and time, um, transporting myself somewhere, just made my entire day kind of work. Everything sort of clicked at that point. It's really important to understand that these ideas of habit are not necessarily a situation where you or I or anyone is trying to find like the perfect habit for us or a right or wrong answer. As time progressed, um, my life changed to the point where now I probably don't have three hours in the middle of the day where I can really just go to a cafe and sort of do that. Um, at that point in time, I was often, you know, spending, you know, some of the nighttime, you know, working on my work. I'd often sort of make that switch where I'd sort of, you know, we'd go out in the day, do fun things, um, go out for lunch a lot. And I, because you can work from home, you can work whenever you want, you know, I'd come home and I'd be sort of, you know, working on some of these things. Uh, again, not a lot of thought process, but a lot of rendering and that kind of stuff. You know, I'd be working on that from, you know, like 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. or something like that. Um, and, you know, whatever, I, you know, whatever happened that day, right, I just sort of finished the work uh, that needed to be done. Uh, sometimes it would be done here, sometimes it would be done there. So, you know, um, now that I have sort of other responsibilities, um, like, you know, sort of young children and stuff like that, it's just not possible to do that. And anyone who's been in that situation is like, can, can attest to this is, is sort of your, 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 your range of options decreases, right? Um, and, and I think there's, there's nothing sort of, again, good or bad about any of these things. I think that often it's so important to understand that the 17 year old who is struggling with how do I stop playing, you know, 20 hours of video games a day and the person who is sitting there going like, please, how can I find one hour a day in my busy schedule to just do something that I want to do? We're all really dealing with the same problem, um, even though it doesn't quite seem that way. And we're often going to use the same tactics, I think, to get out of that situation and find the time. So again, I'll unpack some of this in, in some of the following episodes, but one of the ways that you sort of notice these ritualistic um, events occur is is through modifying the the spatial environmental situation. So again, if I have a different computer, I tend to do different things on it. If I go to a different physical location, I tend to become a different person. I tend to think different things. I get keyed into it. And the process of going there, the process of, of, of actually traveling there, um, and what I would do would just naturally sort of key me into that. It, it's an on-ramp and an off-ramp to this event. And I think as my understanding of a lot of this stuff has progressed, I've really been able to kind of start to hack these things. So I really try and make sure that I do different tasks in different areas of the house. So right now, again, I don't really, I have to do most of my work in the middle of the day. Uh, and I can't necessarily stay up all night and do whatever I want. So what I've noticed is that, you know, when I'm doing writing or planning or thinking, I will do that kind of in a, right, you know, in a sort of moleskin style sort of journal or something like that. And I just make sure that I do that outside on like a, a couch, right? I sort of have like an outdoor couch in my garden and I can go do that there. And, you know, when I'm sort of thinking or I need to plan this or I need to write comic book episodes, I go there. And what I'm really trying to do is make sure that I keep this, like this studio and particularly my workstation that I work on. I really want that to be just for doing work. And that is because I'm going back to that initial idea where when I sit down at that desk, I want to just naturally feel like, oh, what should I do? Oh, that's right. I work here. If I focus too much on typing there, again, even that will really kind of make me a little bit confused. Or often what I'll find is, again, if I'm trying to do the same, a different mental task at the same workstation, it's a little bit jarring because I'm like, I'm, I'm normally doing this here. And so it takes a while to get into the flow. Whereas 
one of the most effective strategies you can employ is to just change the space that you do a particular task in because it will align your mental focus and your sort of mental habitual action. And so again, there's lots of things that I do there, right? What I tend to do is I use a pencil, right, in a, um, you know, again, sketchbook, journal, if I'm sort of planning things, I don't type it because when I'm typing, to me, computer equals drawing and work or something like that. And, and again, it's just all these little things where I found, again, through experimentation that if I just kind of do it this way, I'll just kind of sit down and I'll do this thing. And it's a creative aspect. So it's not that I can't do those things typing. It's that I, I tend to be more creative when I'm using a pencil and a journal. And that's neither right nor wrong. That just tends to be what happens. So I'll leverage that. If I go outside, I'm just used to sitting down in that particular place and it's not anywhere fancy. It's just kind of what I've sort of gotten used to doing. Um, and, you know, it's just the ideas flow. I think about writing. I think about plot. I think about script. And then if I come inside, I'll sit down at the workstation and then I'll just kind of do the drawing part of like what I'm doing that day or I'll, work, or I'll sit down at this workstation and I'll be doing the you know, recording this. I have I have sort of different situations and, and sort of desks and things for doing different things. And I found that's like a very, very easy way of creating a natural uh, onboarding and offboarding um, sort of on-ramp, off-ramp for, you know, particular tasks. So again, that's just an example of how, you know, I've sort of progressed through my career at different points. And, and I want to give, you know, share those things with you so that, uh, again, you can understand sort of how they've affected me and, and how I think they can affect you, um, no matter what sort of stage of your artistic journey you're at. Um, but yeah, I, I found that the more I understand these things and the more I'm able to employ them, the more flexible I found it. Um, and sometimes, again, it's a little bit it's a little bit mysterious, a little bit magical, right? There's some things where I find it's easy to change and there's some things where it's like not. And I think it's just important to appreciate, again, the things that you like doing and the things that work for you, the things that key you into a particular environment. It might be music. It might be, uh, again, like smell. It might be the, the you know, like the, the feeling of like some random thing that you, you never kind of think of, right? Like I think a lot of it is probably... You know, when I draw with one pencil versus another pencil, it's probably a whole bunch of muscle memory stuff that's happening there that is making me think a particular way. And if you do that for hours and hundreds and thousands of hours of doing a particular thing, it's like these silly little things that can be a huge benefit when you're trying to get yourself in a, into a particular mindset. Now, again, it might seem like, oh, that's just a bit wishy-washy, like, oh, you're just being precious, right? Um, that's just kind of artist, you know, talk, but these are the things that really make a difference when it comes to productivity. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people struggle with these things. And I think if you can master them and understand the specific little bits and pieces that really make you tick, that's when you can take conscious control of the habitual systems and turn that into a ritual that you are actually creating to consciously design and engineer the sort of systems of sitting down and doing the thing that you actually want to do. All right. So as I said, I really want to dig into more of the tactical nature of this um, in some following episodes, but hopefully I've made the case about ritual and habit and how important I think this is for you know, developing a good positive relationship to art throughout your artistic journey. But I do want to sort of talk about the takeaways, right? Like how do we sort of think about this set of information and all of the things I've talked about, you know, from a few different viewpoints. From an analytical point of view, if we think about the sort of scientific case for this or the, the thinking case for this, to my mind, there's there's lots of evidence of this out in the world that much of what we are doing is not necessarily us making these conscious choices that to a certain degree, we're running on rails. We're running through these sort of grooves and systems of our own mind that are very repetitive in nature. Often the things that we say we're doing uh, as like a conscious effort are actually either post-rationalized or they're just not even that. They're just what we did yesterday. And I think there's plenty of sort of evidence for this throughout history um, and I think if you just open your eyes and look around, you see that in most cases, this is actually what's happening. 
I also think that, again, we can really understand how important these ideas of ritual and space and having on ramps and off ramps to our you know, creative time is really critical. As artists, we're in a unique position where the thing that we're doing really requires us to have this kind of focus where we go into this place and we feel right. We feel as if we're in the right area. We feel as if, you know, things are going well. We've got a positive relationship to it. And we also have a lot of control over this, and that can be good and bad. Many of these ritualistic systems are actually created by people, not necessarily because they're thinking of it that way, just because that's how the incentive schemes work. If you tend to, if you're running, again, like a, a small sporting school or something like that, you're trying to get kids to go and do a thing. You kind of make it fun. You develop those gamification systems. If you're trying to get people to play video games, again, you know, you work all the dopamine systems. You work these natural things that exist within the the the, the biological human to to make them do something. But you know, as artists, we are you know, often just by our, we're just by ourselves and, you know, we're kind of sitting there on our own and there's a much wider range of, you know, what we can and can't think and feel. You know, we're not in a social structure where, you know, it's like, oh, how do I act? Oh, that's right. This is how the other people, you know, 10 people who are playing this, you know, game, uh, you know, this or playing this sport are behaving. It's just us. And so it's important to understand that that is both the biggest risk for developing bad habits or getting in our head, you know, having this artist angst, you know, feeling bad or whatever. But it's also the best sort of offer of potentiality here where you need to understand that you can kind of engineer this however you want. You have a lot of control here if you really put some time into figuring out how you tick. The top line analytical way of viewing this is that tweaking and modifying and developing your habits is the most efficient way to make sure that you're directing your energy and your life force over time. If you get these right, a lot of the other stuff just kind of happens on its own. So it's the most efficient way that you can change who you are and what you do every day. For the bro, simplified version of all of this, I think we can fall back to a nice little classic by Aristotle via Will Durant. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. If we try and consider what some action steps or real sort of takeaways that you can go and do right now might be, I really want to unpack some of this tactical stuff over the following episodes. But what you can do is just try and observe where some of these ideas of ritual or habit have existed within your own career, within your own schedule, and whether or not you sort of see some of these ideas occurring in other people. And again, how you relate to some of your good or bad habits. Think about this stuff and how it has related to your life. Because I can, again, a big part of this is understanding and trusting that this stuff does work. Because it's not always easy to develop one of these habits. You do have to work on it and have strategies and figure out what motivates you and what works. For me, again, this idea of situational change seems to be really sort of functional. And, and I've seen it work with other people too. But again, you might be different. A big part of this is to a certain degree understanding how you actually might go about, you know, changing these habits in yourself. So part of that is understanding, you know, what tends to motivate you? What responses and stimulus do you tend to really, you know, respond to well? Uh, again, that could be situational, it could be a matter of um, activity, there's a huge number of things that we'll go over. But again, just try and think of, you know, what things have, you know, helped you relate to this idea of habit or ritual, good or bad, in the past. Lastly, if we think about this from the spiritual aspect, I think this side of it should be fairly apparent. This idea of creating ritual and controlling the way that we feel by these kind of repeated actions and weird things that we do as humans has a very, very long history. And I think there's no real need to separate that from your experience as an artist because I think we intuitively understand a lot of these things. The act of creation is a ritual and I think it has a deep spiritual meaning to a lot of us. But even if it doesn't, 
I think it's still important to just appreciate that this idea of ritual is one of the best ways to kind of manifest a lot of your energy and emotion and turn it into productivity. This is how we have been as a species channeling a lot of our energy towards our sort of desired goals and outcomes throughout time. And you are no different. And all of this technology and all of this other stuff doesn't really matter if you're not able to sit down and do it and appreciate and enjoy that experience. So the idea of ritual is, I think, inherently spiritual. But even if you're not interested in any of that, it's a really important thing for you to realize that you are actually engaging in many of these things through sitting down, even if you don't think about it that way. And the more that you connect with that, I think the more you'll actually be able to motivate yourself across time to be the type of artist that you want to be. Okay. So that's probably all I've got time for in this particular episode. I find this topic fascinating mostly because, again, I think it does give a lot of meaning to what we do. It's also helped me to understand what I'm actually, you know, doing day in, day out. And viewing it this way has been immensely useful when it comes to my own productivity, really kind of understanding and digging down into this stuff. And and I have found that, again, it's a great mix of where all of these ideas of sort of science, spirituality, uh, philosophy, and productivity kind of intermingle and really kind of meet in the middle. So I think this idea is incredibly useful. As I said, you can access this from some sort of spiritual angle if that's something that you have. Um, I think that's a good way to sort of get into this idea and, and understand it. But if you don't, again, just understand there's a huge scientific and philosophical background and basis for these ideas. This is what we've been doing as humans since the beginning of you know human time let's say and the more you master it the more you hack it the more efficient you're going to be at you know engaging and channeling your energy across space and time let me know if you've got any comments or questions etc down below on youtube if you've got some time leave me a review on the apple podcast app or on youtube like subscribe etc i've been really sort of excited to see the response that we've gotten so far to the podcast um so i really really appreciate that again i read all the comments i appreciate all the time you're putting into here to again let me know your stories and how this stuff affects you that's super Super useful goes into me thinking about again what sort of to talk about next and again you know super keen to hear um, about what everyone is going through when it comes to trying to get better at art anyway other than that we'll catch around and i'll see you on the next one